Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, this is, I guess, my second visit in, uh, in less than a year. So I'm really uh, enjoying um, meeting several people here. And it's good to see you all. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting sight. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's hard to tell you apart. Uh, it sort of answers the age-old question of why zebras have stripes. <laughs> It's a question we ask in Viva as often. Um, I, um, the last time I was here, I spoke about uh, something completely different, which was uh, on the topic of uh, how insects build structures, uh, termite architecture, uh, and so on. Uh, but this is more what the, my lab focuses on, uh, on the questions of uh, how insects fly. Now, you know, this uh, has been a question that has driven me at for at least 20 years, I started out with the idea that you know I'd, I'd try and answer a few questions that I had, and then move on to something else. And uh, I find here now, 20 years later, still uh, just as fascinated or more fascinated with this question than uh, I ever was. And that's in large part because in science, um, when the more you find out, the more you know that you didn't know. Uh, and this is something that uh, just keeps, helps you in the process of finding questions. Now, I'm not going to talk about this question from, you know, not cover all aspects of this question. It's just too vast a topic. So what I've left out, and I'll already tell you at the very beginning of the talk, is I've left out aerodynamics from this. You'll, we will brush upon some of the principles, but uh, I will not talk about a bulk of the work that we've done on uh, how insects generate uh, flight forces. This is a, maybe a topic for some other time. And I want instead to focus, I, I also will not talk for the most part about the nervous system. Although again, I'll brush up on that and I can't uh, uh, but help, you know, at least touch upon that topic. But the specific thing that I want to talk about today is this, this, this sub-question here, which is how insects deal with the challenge of miniaturization. Um, but let me start uh, by showing you a movie. I'll show you two quick movies. And these are, this is an insect which uh, all of you have seen, uh, maybe as early as uh, this morning. Um, this is a house fly. I think all of you have seen this uh, fly, and I, I'm sure you've seen it many times. And I'm sure what you're going to see is also something that you've seen many times. Um, the only difference is that uh, this is filmed, the movie that you're about to see is filmed uh, with a high-speed camera. Uh, so this is filmed at almost uh, 4,000 frames a second. Your normal camera operates at something like 25 to 30 frames a second. So that's the only difference. Uh, but as you will see, when you have a high-speed camera, it's almost like having a microscope in time. So you are able to see things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. Uh, and what the, the two behaviors that I've chosen to show you are both very mundane behaviors. One involves looking at a fly as it takes off. You've seen that all the time. And another involves uh, the fly as it lands. And I want you to uh, pay attention to just how exquisite both of these things are. Uh, just some quick facts. This is, uh, as I said, a house fly. It's called Musca domestica. Uh, and it flaps its wings between 200 to 250 times a second. Okay? Uh, that's about four milliseconds per stroke. Just keep that number in mind as we watch these two movies. Okay? So here's one. Now you can see, what I want you to notice is that as soon as it has left the substrate, it is already pretty stable. And it's doing a lot of very interesting things with the two wings as it is taking off. But I think all of us will agree that this fly knows what it's doing. It's stable. It is not struggling to fly. It's not likely to fall off the air, right? Now, here's another one, which is uh, even, even more fascinating. Uh, and I should tell you that this was a completely accidental movie. We did not intend to get this. This was a complete stroke of luck uh, that we got this movie. And what you will see here is a fly coming in and landing on this glass vial. Okay, now, uh, if I were to tell you that you know, we carefully 
engineered this behavior to occur here at, at this time, uh, I think you should be skeptical because firstly, flies don't do what you want them to do. Uh, they have their own mind. They, uh, they, and it's a fairly active mind. I can assure you that. Um, but also because uh, you know, to get a movie like this is it does require some level of uh, planning and sophistication. And the reason for that is, uh, how many of you do photography? Few. Okay. So if you work with cameras, and if you work especially with these things called macro lenses, which allow you to uh, look at very small things, uh, then you know that the trade-off with trying to look at very small things is that you don't have depth of field. Okay? So you can only sort of uh, look at things that are very, uh, in a very small region of space. And so to get a fly to come and sit in that small region of space is quite a challenge. Um, so I should say, so we were lucky. The fly sort of, we, we were thinking of looking at a takeoff behavior just as the one you saw before. Uh, but the fly took off. I was slow to hit the trigger. So what you do normally is these are high-speed cameras. So you know you want you're sitting there with a with a trigger, okay? And the the cameras um, are taking films continuously. And what you can decide with the trigger is what part of the pre and post trigger uh, time points you want to capture. So you can say, for instance. I want to capture a second before and a second after okay, the, um, the trigger. So here's the movie. Here comes the fly. And I want you to notice that its front legs are already up. So this fly knows it's going to land. And it's going to now um, pitch up. This is all happening with the aid of these two wings. Slows down and lines. Okay? And I was lucky that I hit the trigger slightly late. So I missed the takeoff part, but I got the landing part quite by accident. Now, what I showed you are examples of what we in biology call behavior. Okay? This is uh, what an animal does, but with a slight, uh, uh, with a slight difference. Okay? Um, the things we call behaviors are typically things that you can uh, elicit repeatedly. So I can, I can film take off flight any number of times. And I, can, I know that I can get a flight to take off. I can either you know, uh, take an object close to it, and it will fly away, or something like that. But it will keep doing this again and again. And you treat this very much as a statistical entity. Okay? So you, Film, you try to control the conditions under which you elicit this behavior, and you repeatedly uh, film this uh, behavior. And then you treat it very much as a statistical entity, meaning that you're, you know, you're looking at an ensemble, uh, all of which more or less behave the same way. And then you try to look at what are the generalities of, of all these behaviors. So what I've just told you is that part of the challenge is to see a behavior out there in the wild, and then bring it to the lab, and try to reconstitute it in the lab, okay, under controlled conditions. And once you've done that, then a whole set of questions open up. So this part is just about where you find those behaviors. You know, flies are looking for mates. They're looking for food. They're guarding territories. They are uh, navigating. You know, they're they're navigating in uh, short or long distance. All of these lead to behaviors that relate to flight. And once you've found a behavior like that, then a whole stream of questions open up. You can ask, what are the sensory cues? For instance, I loomed an object in front of the fly. The fly got, let's say, scared, uh, to use an anthropomorphic term. Um, and it took off. Okay? So vision was involved. Maybe I gave it a puff of air. Maybe that causes flies to uh, take off. Maybe I make a sound. Maybe that causes flies to take off. You know, all of these are things that you would uh, term as sensory cues. So when I say sensory feedback, it's actually multiple arrows going in. Okay? It's not just one arrow. Because there are multiple sensors that are feeding 
into the central nervous system, which then sort of combines all this. And there's a there's an absolutely wonderful world of computational uh, neuroscience out there, which tries to address how exactly these computations occur. Uh, and all of these computations occur. They are then converged down to a set of neurons called the motor neurons. Okay, these motor neurons are those neurons which connect to the muscles. And these muscles are then sort of this, there's a lot of them, and they perform a concert of actions which then causes the behavior to occur. But the muscles can only ever contract, right? You all know that. And when they contract, they pull on body parts. We have an internal skeleton. They pull our an internal uh, on our uh, bones and joints. Uh, flies, uh, insects have an external skeleton, an exoskeleton. So the muscles are pulling on the thorax. And we're going to see a lot of that uh, in the, in the late, later half of the talk. Um, so they pull on this region, which we call the musculoskeletal system. And that causes thoracic oscillations. The thorax will then sort of oscillate. Okay? And because of those oscillations, which are transduced by an extraordinarily complex wing hinge, which again I'm going to show you today, uh, into uh, motions of the wings. Okay? So the wings then move, and when they move, they interact with the external fluid medium, which is air, which then causes locomotive forces, torques around the body, and that is what eventually leads to what we see as behavior. Okay, so the aerodynamics of insect flight is one aspect of the question. The uh, musculoskeletal system is another aspect of the question. The, you know, the sensory motor feedback, how the nervous system works is another aspect. These are entire fields in of themselves, right? And then, of course, there's the ecology and the evolution part of this problem. And all of these sort of combine when you're studying insect flight, which is why it is such a fascinating topic. When I started out, this is all I cared about, okay? And in the process of uh, answering questions there, I've discovered all of these other things. And uh, so I think I'll remain employed for a while. Um, so those are all the different uh, projects that are ongoing in the lab. There's quite a few of them. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk about uh, a few of them. Okay? And there's some other projects, uh, including some plant biomechanics and uh, uh, termite architecture and insect architecture in general. Um, I'll be happy to talk about these if, if any one of you want to discuss them later. But let's start with flight and why, why worry about flight, or why you know, be so fascinated with flight. Um, I think all of you recognize that uh, insects are the most successful multicellular taxon on Earth. Uh, they have always been and they always will be, I think. Uh, they've been around much longer than we have. I think they'll survive us. Uh, there's an estimated 6 to 10 million species. Uh, and we've barely covered 1 million okay, in being able to describe them. And I hope we get to the others before we get rid of them. Uh, they, are, uh, they, they are a substantial majority of, I think that's more like 80% of all multicellular animals. Uh, they're flying uh, insects range from size scales spanning three orders of magnitude. This is a topic of discussion today. Think about it. It's, it's absolutely spectacular. You know, we, we are roughly a meter in size. We're thinking of something that would be about a kilometer, ranging from our size to that of a kilometer in size, right? I, I mean, on the order of. That's the kind of size range we're talking about. Um, they occupy a vast variety of ecological niches. Uh, you know, you'll find them in Antarctica. You'll find them on the tops of um, Himalayas. Uh, you'll find them in water, all sorts of places, right? And they have been around since at least 400 million years. So, if we just focus now of all these things on the um, on the uh, size scale issue, then uh, there's some very interesting things to think about. The first is, so this here is the fossil of the largest insect uh, that we know of. Okay? And this is uh, a dragonfly 
which was uh, from the Carboniferous period about 300 million years ago, which had a wingspan. So the distance between this and that was about uh, 65 centimeters. Okay. Uh, that is a scary insect. Uh, but this is extinct now. Okay. Uh, of the extant insects, you have uh, this one probably takes the prize for the the largest insect. This is Queen Alexandra's bird wing. We have something that's pretty close to that size uh, in the in the Western Ghats. You'll see something called a um, southern bird wing, which is uh, about as big as this, and that is that wingspan is about one foot, okay, thirty centimeters. Large insect. Now, at the other end of the spectrum is this remarkable animal, okay, which was described by Polylov recently, um, which is uh, it's, it's a type of wasp uh, called the Megaphragma uh, mymarapin. And it is about a little less than 200 microns in size. Okay. That, for comparison, is a paramecium, cell of a paramecium. Okay. This is, these are both to scale. And uh, you can see that you know, this uh, animal is smaller than some single-celled animals. Yet, you can see that it has a nice antenna. It has eyes. I'll show you these eyes in uh, in a different insect, but close in. It has wings. These wings uh, are more feathery in structure. Uh, I shouldn't brush-like in structure, not feathery, but brush-like in structure, uh, not paddle-like. But they are so small that it doesn't matter. Uh, they both act the same way, uh, and they have a functioning nervous system, and they are doing very interesting things, almost like any other insect uh, that you've seen. Here's uh, one that we are working with. It's a trichogramma wasp. It's not uh, as small as the one that I just showed you, but it's about 400 microns in size, still less than half a millimeter. Literally, if you take a pencil and you put a dot on a white sheet of paper, that's how small it looks. Okay. Uh, and yet, look, I mean, it's it looks very much like a normal insect. Uh, this one doesn't have those feathery structures. You have these kind of uh, bristles coming out, but uh, its wings are paddle-like. Uh, it has eyes. These are the compound eyes, uh, which are shown here in a close-up image. And you can see the individual units uh, that are also uh, blown up here. So, uh, and these fly. As you can see in this video, this is something. It's, it's very difficult to get these videos because you're focusing on a very tiny area with a high-speed camera, and so you're not almost always you're not uh, you don't have sufficient light. If you try to put too much light, the insects just dehydrate. So they, you, it's really kind of difficult. But uh, we managed to get this one. This is uh, Abin and Akash, Vardhan and Abin Ghosh. And you can see immediately that you know they do this curious kind of clap uh, of the wings. I'll show this to you again. Uh, <laughs> so the question that really is fascinating to us at this point in time, having you know studied a little bit about how they generate. Uh, like forces and aerodynamics and so on, is how do you get a nervous system? How do you pack it into something that small? And how is it able to uh, conduct its business, uh, given that it's been packed in such small spaces? And we're going to try and address that, uh, just the sort of general principles of it. Uh, but before we do that, just for a minute, think from the perspective of a small insect, what are the challenges that this insect is going to face? Okay. Um, one of the problems uh, that insects face when they are small is that they have to, I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit, that insects, as you reduce their size, they have to flap faster. Okay. So a lot of these high wing beat frequencies that I just showed you come from the fact that they are miniaturized. Okay. And there's a physical reason for that. 
So they need, if you need to flap faster, then you need to acquire information faster. Okay? So the sensory system has to act with much higher temporal resolution than uh, your normal, uh, you know, we are sluggish in comparison. Um, if I lose my footing and I stumble, it takes me up to a half a second to a second uh, before I'll actually hit the ground. Uh, insects don't have that luxury, right? So they need to act much faster. Uh, the motor system commensurately needs to be uh, faster and more accurate. So it's useless if only your sensors are fast and your motor system is still slow. Um, then, of course, you have things like uh, energy losses. You know, you're flapping many more times, which means that you're wasting a lot more energy because there's always some loss. Now you have to reduce those losses, and that is going to uh, uh, the way to reduce them requires uh, elastic storage mechanisms. Insects have uh, one of the well, the best known rubber uh, in in natural world or in any world. It's about 95, uh, 97 percent. Uh, efficient. It's called resilient. Okay, it's it's an extraordinary uh, biological material. Of course, they lose water. Those must be compensated. There's many, many more questions like that. Why do they need to flap faster? And that's a very uh, simple explanation for that, which is that. So the equation for flight forces is this. You know, it's half the C, uh, the this, there's a coefficient of lift just. Think of it as a multiplication factor uh, times the density of air. Let's not worry about that. The velocity of the wing, uh, the square of it, uh, and the area of the wing. Okay. And so, if you break down uh, the velocity of the wing into the angular extent of the wing, that's this angle phi, uh, n, which is the frequency of the wing and the length of the wing. So if you work through this now, you find that the flight forces uh, go as uh, a cube of the wing length, but because the chord length, the, the, uh, so this is the wing length and that's the chord length, that chord length is also a function of wing length. So it actually goes as the fourth power okay, of the wing length. So you can, you can increase flight forces as the fourth power, but your mass is only increasing as a cubic. Uh, power of uh, r, which means that you have to do something in order to, to maintain those flight forces. And that can only be done uh, by increasing uh, the, uh, the frequency. And sure enough, when you look at insects, as you decrease in size, the wing beat frequency increases. And this is shown here in, in two ways. One is in terms of uh, decrease in size as a uh, with body mass as a metric, and here is just size as a metric. And in both cases, what you find is that as body mass decreases or as wing length decreases, you find that the uh, wing beat frequency increases. These are log log plots, so uh, you can see that they actually increase almost by an order of magnitude, and they can go up to almost thousand hertz. Okay, mosquitoes have been recently uh, shown to operate at something like 750 hertz. Uh, midges go up to 1,000 uh, reportedly. So this is remarkable. Okay? I mean, let's just put that in perspective. Uh, your eye blink is about 150 milliseconds, okay? about, let's say, somewhere between 150 to 200 milliseconds. In that time, um, a fly has completed something like, oh, 50 wing strokes. Okay? There's no, <laughs> there should be no surprise that you can't swat them. They're far too fast for us. So the question is, how are they able to do this? Okay, if, um, if you've learned about muscles, you know that for muscles to twitch or for muscles to contract, they need uh, a stimulus from a neuron, the motor neuron. But can the nervous system operate this fast? The nervous system comes up with its own set of constraints. Uh, you know, a typical action potential is on the order of one or two milliseconds. So how are you going to pack several action potentials which are required for a wing stroke into, uh, into that shorter time frame? 
Now the answer to that is very, very interesting. Okay? And I'm going to just take you through that and I hope I do justice. So certain kinds of insects, especially those that have miniaturized, okay? so of the orders of uh, diptera, which is flies, mosquitoes, etc., coleoptera, beetles, um, then uh, hymenoptera, bees, uh, wasps, etc. These have evolved a kind of muscle which is called the myogenic muscle. Okay? Then the myogenic muscle is a muscle that uh, does not require a constant neural input to uh, contract. All you have to do is take the muscle, okay, in an in vivo case, you extract the muscle, you keep it in physiological solution, and if you stretch it, then with some delay, it contracts. Okay? All it requires is a stretch. You can cut the neuron that feeds it, and you this will still work. Now, if you compare an insect that does not have this myogenic or asynchronous muscle form, it is called asynchronous because it does not require a one to one neural stimulation. Okay? So if you compare an insect, this is a larger insect, flaps much slower than this beetle. And you can see that there, the wing movement of the beetle is much faster than that of a locust. And uh, but the underlying nervous system is not that much faster. Okay? So this thing has reached its limit more or less. Whereas here, there is a one to one correspondence between the nervous system and the wing flapping. Here there is isn't. This is why it is called asynchronous. Okay? And if you look at the physiological properties, then you see this kind of delayed stretch activation occurring. Okay? So here is locusts and here is beetles. So this is uh, the stress on the uh, on the muscle, uh, the force per unit area with which you uh, stretch it, and then this is the strain on it. Uh, and if you take a small part of it, you actually see what's going on. And you can see that in this case, whereas when the strain stops, the muscle sort of comes back uh, a little bit. Here, it continues to extend, okay, uh, or to contract. Now. You take these muscles, okay? These are remember this stretch activation property because I'm going to come back to it uh, many times. Now you take these muscles and you pack them in the following way, okay? This is the thorax of the insect. That's where the head is. That's where the abdomen is. And the green muscles here are the ones uh, that we call the dorsal longitudinal muscles because they go sort of longitudinally, uh, and the uh, I don't know what this color is. Peach muscles are the ones uh, that go from uh, sort of top to bottom, and they call the dorsoventral muscles. Okay, so these are an antagonistic set of muscles. Just as we have flexors and extensors, right? So for the flexors do the opposite of what the extensor does. Similarly, you have these dorsolongitudinal muscles and the dorsoventral muscles. So now, if these contract, okay, the thorax is going to be pulled in. Okay, and if the thorax is pulled in, these dorsoventral muscles are going to be extended. Correct. Now I told you that the stretch activation property means that if this is activated after a short time, it's going to contract, and now this will be extended, and then this will contract, and this will be extended, and this way, just through the physics of the the musculoskeletal system, you can get many strokes for each wing beat. Uh, for each uh, neur uh, neural stimulation, okay, is that clear? And this allows insects to, by an order of magnitude, increase their wing beat frequency. And you see this has happened uh, several. So this is the phylogeny of insects. So sort of like a family tree of insects. Uh, so you see all the insects here. These are dragonflies up there. Locusts are right there. But if you look down here in sort of the more recent taxa, I, I, I should hesitate to call this more recent, but uh, you know, they, they have sort of specialized. And that's where you see two things. One is a lot of miniaturization, and two is the presence of this myogenic muscle and this 
indirect flight muscle architecture. The indirect flight muscle architecture is just this. This is the idea that muscles don't directly connect to the wings, they connect to the thorax, the inner shell of the thorax, and they are actually moving the inner shell of the thorax. Okay? So if you combine the two, you have this combination that allows you to raise the wing beat frequency, and that's what you're seeing here. And you see that immediately you start seeing the hyperdiverse orders. If hyperdiversity is a measure of success, then this has allowed insects to be more successful. And it shouldn't surprise us, therefore, that we see so many beetles and uh, flies and bees. Uh, Lepidoptera don't have this uh, kind of myogenic. So they, they are a bit of an outlier. We don't know why they are this successful. But certainly, wing beat frequency is not the reason why. So this is, this is just what I told you. You have. Um, the indirect flight muscles, which contract, causing wing elevation. As, so when the DVMs contract, the uh, dorsal ventral muscles contract, you have wing elevation. When the dorsal longitudinal muscles contract, wing depression. And this cycle causes wings to move very rapidly. Now in addition to that, in addition to these muscles, which sort of actuate the big motions of the uh, insect, you have many tiny muscles. And I'll talk about them later in the talk. Uh, they are called the direct, direct steering muscles. And just hold that thought, and we'll come to it later. Okay. So we got into this question primarily through a very talented graduate student, Tanvi Devra, who worked in my lab. Uh, and we started asking questions about how can insects be so fast and yet so precise? And they have to be precise. If they are not precise, you will not see those exquisite maneuvers that I just showed you uh, at the beginning of the talk. You know, insects will wear off course. It doesn't take much uh, for something that light to wear off course. So how can they be both fast and precise at the same time? I think most of you are aware, many of you might play cricket or you know, other games, that if you try to increase your speed, your accuracy trades off. You're not able to be as precise. But, but insects seem to be able to do both. So let's uh, talk about this question a little bit. So insects have sensory systems which are, as I said, operate very fast. And they are able to tell the insect in real time uh, how they are doing. And this is not very different from us. We have uh, our inner ear system, which allows us to keep balance. If, if, uh, if I uh, perturb the inner ear system, or if there's, there's a disease there, then it causes vertigo. right? You'll, uh, you'll have a chakkar and you'll fall. Um, so similarly, insects also have uh, so something uh, that serves the purpose. But remember that insects are moving in three dimensions. Okay? And what it has is a structure that uh, is a gyroscope. How many of you know what a gyroscope is? So a gyroscope, OK, a gyroscope is a an instrument that used to be used by uh, captains in, uh, on uh, ships and so on uh, to tell about you know, whether they were keeping uh, a, a steady course, uh, or whether they were. It's very hard in the sea to know if you are uh, too tilted or something like that. And gyroscopes allowed you to keep, keep that uh, sense. And these are vibrational gyroscopes. Normal gyroscopes are rotational. And what you can see is right there, you see that white structure that's moving exactly antiphase to the wings? That structure is the gyroscope of an insect. It's called the hortier. It used to be a wing. Okay? But one of the things that has happened through evolution is it's reduced in size. It's become this mechanosensory organ, which is then able to uh, sense how fast the insect is uh, turning in air. And so that's what it, so this is the hortia right there. And if you look at it closely, what you see, so this is the hortia. And if you focus on these two structures here, you can see this, this almost con-like appearance. Each of those bumps is a mechanosensory unit. Okay? One neuron is connected to that that particular uh, organ. 
it is called a companiform sensillum. Okay. And it is just a little bump on the cuticle, but it measures stra strain of the uh, on the cuticle. Okay. So, um, and the field of these are packing a lot of information about what forces the haltier is experiencing. Okay. So, the way this works is that the haltier sort of moves in a plane. Okay. And if the plane of the rotation changes, then because of conservation of angular momentum, it is going to try and maintain its plane of rotation. And that causes a force on the uh, haltiers, it is called the Corioli force. And that force um, is what causes the haltier to sort of bend. And those bends are being detected by this, this sensory system, which then reports this real time uh, to the nervous system which then uh, makes sense of it and says okay you are you're turning left at this rate or you are turning right at this rate and that allows them to get the constant feedback which allows them to maintain uh, stability. If this feedback were slower the insect would have a harder time maintaining stability. Okay? So these uh, companiform sensilli talk directly to the wing this uh, wing steering muscles uh, as also do uh, inputs from the visual system. So somewhere here information from vision and mechanosensation is being integrated okay? and the, the brain is making sense of it all uh, to try and understand how the insect maneuvers. Now if you knock out the haltier system then you have a problem. So here is uh, a normal insect taking off. This is Okay. Here is an insect in which both haltiers are ablated. Now here is an insect in which only the left haltier is ablated. You can see it is turning in one direction and you can see that with its wings it is trying to actually stabilize, but it cannot because it does not have accurate feedback and this is where the right haltier is ablated. and it does fine for a little bit and then suddenly veers out of control there. So it is a very important sense. Now what you noticed in that movie that I showed you was that the haltier was exactly anti-phase to the wing and you can see that here. right? So the wings are exactly in phase and they have to be exactly in phase. I mean they cannot even be a little off because that is going to cause imbalances that cause them to turn around. So they are exactly in phase, the haltiers are exactly out of phase and the natural question one must ask is how can the nervous system operate this fast. This is happening you know in, in the insect that I showed you uh, within 10 milliseconds, but it is true even in Drosophila or, or the house flies which are 4 milliseconds. How can the system be this fast and yet this precise? So the obvious answers that come to mind are maybe it is uh, all neurally driven. So you, what you have here is a wing sensory neuron that talks to the haltier motor neuron. Okay, It is in a reflex kind of a loop and so this uh, causes uh, you know when the wing goes up the haltier goes down or it causes uh, you have the haltier sensory neuron talking to the wing motor neuron, haltier goes down, wing goes up or you have one neuron that tells the wings to go down years to go up, but even that is going to be slow as compared to what is needed. So the counter hypothesis that we had or then we had uh, was that maybe this is uh, not neurally driven at all, maybe this is uh, mechanical coupling. Okay? In which case you know you do not need the nervous system, you, all you need is mechanical connections that cause one to go up and the other to go down. And this is an easier hypothesis to test 
because all you have to do is wait for the insect to die and then work on a dead insect. So that led to a series of experiments which we called the dead bug experiment. So I will just show you a quick video. Uh, so this is a dead insect. Um, it is not gone into rigor mortis yet, just freshly dead. And what Tanvi does is move just one wing. Okay? And watch what happens when she moves just one wing. I think it is obvious what is happening. Right? Uh, what is happening is when you move one wing, the other wing moves. There must be a mechanical connection between these two wings. And then the halteas move opposite. So all of this is mechanical connection. So Tanvi joined as a, uh, as a very keen uh, neurobiology aspirant. And by the time she had finished her first experiment, she was sure that she was not going to be a neurobiologist, at least not in as long as she worked on this project, because the whole project veered towards the side of mechanics. And so she spent the next uh, four or five years actually very meticulously charting out where these connections were, how do they, uh, how do they connect to each other, and how, are, how is this, all this actuated. And so I'll just give you a quick uh, summary of uh, what she has found out. So this is the thorax. That is the front of the thorax, it is called the scutum. That is the hind of the thorax, it is called the scutellum. Okay, I have given it a gray shade. And if you look at it from the side, you can see that the scutellum has this little arm that comes right under the wing. Okay. Um, these are horrible names. I, I do not know. Uh, many years ago, I kind of ran away from these names. So partly what drove me to physics was these horrible anatomical names. So I'm sorry I'm imposing them, them on you, uh, but um, you know, when the right question comes along, you've got to learn them. Um, so I'll just summarize uh, Tanvi's work in a video. Uh, so this gives me a break while you watch the video. Um, This movie summarizes her findings on the biomechanics of wing and hortia coordination in flies. Our study shows that precise coordination between wings and hortia is achieved not by the nervous system, but by mechanical connections within the thorax. A structure on the thorax, the scutellum, links the two wings. Rapid coordination of the indirect asynchronous flight muscles drive the motion of the scutellum which causes simultaneous in-phase movement of both wings. When this link is severed, the two wings become uncoordinated as shown in the next video. Thus the scutellar linkage is necessary for wing-wing coordination. Although the two wings are not coordinated anymore, the hortiers on each side oscillate antiphase to the ipsilateral wing. When the two wings become uncoordinated, the halteas also become mutually uncoordinated. We next showed that the wing haltier coordination is mediated by a separate mechanical linkage, the subepimeral ridge, which connects the wing base to the haltier base. When the subepimeral ridge is intact, the wings and halteas oscillate exactly antiphase with respect to each other. However, when this link is lesioned, wings and hortiers become uncoordinated. Notice that the hortia continues to move through its full amplitude, driven by the asynchronous hortia muscles. The hortia on the right side, whose link remains intact as an internal control, continues to oscillate exactly antiphase with the contralateral wing. Thus, the subepimeral linkage between the wing and the hortia system on both sides are independent of each other. If the wings and hot ears are constrained to move in synchrony by mechanical linkages, how do insects achieve control of just one wing at a time? To address this question, we propose the hypothesis that there exists a clutch at the base of each wing, which can engage or disengage the wing from the mechanical linkages. When the clutch is engaged on both sides, 
the two wings flap together. However, when the clutch is disengaged on one side, one wing remains folded whereas the other can flap. Apart from the clutch, the base of the wing contains a gearbox. Once the wing is engaged, the gearbox controls the amplitude of each wing. If we zoom into the base of the fly wing during active flapping, we can see the wing edge. It consists of a radial stop shown in red, a plural wing process shown in yellow, and Terale C, a putative mechanic sensor and damper shown in blue. The radial stop contacts plural wing process in four different modes. Mode 0, 1, 2 and 3 as shown here. In this scanning electron microscope image, we see how the radial stop connects with the plural wing process in four different ways from mode 0 to mode 3. Here is a video of the wing engagement at the start of flight as the radial stop moves from mode 0 to higher modes. Notice the shift in the wing amplitude from very low to very high within a single wing stroke. Once engaged, the wing hinge shifts between the different modes and the wing moves at high amplitudes. This is akin to the gear change operation in automobiles. During flight cessation, the wing abruptly transitions from high amplitudes to low amplitudes within a wing stroke as seen in this video. When this happens, the radial stop moves from higher modes to mode 0. Okay, so... So that's what uh, Tanvi found out. And uh, so that's the general model uh, that we have uh, for the, the thorax. The, so these are all the mechanical linkages, uh, the wing hortier linkage, which we've given our own ugly biology name. It's called the subepimeral ridge uh, because it goes under this structure called the epimeron. It doesn't matter. It's just an ugly name that we thought we should impose on biology. Um, so the indirect flight muscles that uh, cause the wings to move together, then the hortiers, uh, which have their own sets of muscles. Uh, and so this is, a, in, in physical terms, a coupled oscillator model. Okay? So these two systems are coupled oscillators, and they are weakly coupled. In other words, uh, you know, we, so to show that, uh, what we can show is that if you start to clip the wings, you can actually perturb the frequency, because this is a resonant system. And so what you do is you can increase the frequency, okay? And as you increase the frequency, the hortier follows suit. But beyond a point, the wing continues to increase the frequency, but the hortier comes right back to its uh, original frequency. And this is classic uh, uh, behavior uh, that you see in uh, weakly coupled oscillators. If it were strongly coupled, the hortiers would always stay in pace with the wings. Uh, and if it were uncoupled, it would be flat. Okay. Now, if you think about this, this is the sort of thing that allows insects to actually cope very nicely with wing damage. So when there is wing damage, there's going to be an, a change in its frequency. But because the wing and hortiers are weakly coupled, for substantial amount of wing damage, in this case, you know, almost 40% of its wing is gone. But 
the Holtea continues to be out of phase accurately, right. So, the mechanical linkages are a, actually a very nice way of doing this. We have gone one step ahead um, and actually in the Drosophila system we have asked about questions about what is happening now in the nervous system. I told you that there is a clutch, but what I what the implication of that is that the two clutches should be engaged synchronously. How does that happen? And what we found out this is in collaboration with uh, Professor Gaiti Hassan and her student Sufia Sadaf uh, at NCBS. We found that there is this um, neuron called the ventral unpaired medial neuron. This is in, uh, in a genetic model system of Drosophila, which throws true projections bilateral projections into the motor neurons of the two wings on both sides and that allows this structure to simultaneously or this neuron to simultaneously activate those two neurons and engage the clutch. And so if you put it together now you have the this is now looking from the top you have the dorsal longitudinal muscles, the dorsal ventral muscles, the linkages both the wing wing linkages in green and the wing haltier linkages. Um, and this sits on top of the neural tissue which is shown in gray. In the last little bit let us come to the uh, to the direct flight muscles, the steering muscles which I promised I would tell you about. There is many of them ok, there is al almost 16 to 18 pairs depending on which insects you are looking at and we needed to look at them, but they are all inside and so it, it was not easy and it required uh, collaborating with uh, Dr. Namrata Gundeya at uh, the IISC uh, and a lot of very talented students all of whom are have gone on to do uh, to nice places. Um, and so here is uh, again a video that shows you what this looks like. This is a micro CT image, uh, micro CT is a way of uh, looking at structures internally and we really need to do that now because uh, you know there is a lot of action that is happening inside. So, here is the radial stop and the pleural wing process I think this video is misbehaving sorry. So, I am going to switch out of the Maybe this works better. So, that is the lateral view of the wing hinge. This is widely considered one of the most complicated joints uh, in animal kingdom. So, that is the radial stop that connects to the wings, that is the gearbox that I showed you, the frame mechanosensor and damper. This is the part that uh, coordinates both wings, that is one sclerite, this is a, a plate on the cuticle. And that is controlled by these two muscles, ok. Now, let us this is another sclerite, this has no muscles, axillary sclerite 2. This one is axillary sclerite 3, and it has several muscles so 3 1, 3 2, 3 3, 3 4, and that in combination looks like this, ok. Then there is a fourth sclerite also composing the hinge. So, this is again five muscles that uh, you know it uh, uh, that actuate this sclerite which together then look like this and then you have the bacilla sclerite which which is responsible for major movements of the wings uh, and this has three muscles and the mutual organization of these muscles is also a very fascinating topic which uh, is an extremely difficult one uh, from a physics perspective this is uh, something I would call a worse than a three body problem uh, because there are several uh, several muscles and uh, you know the constraints uh, do not bring it down to less than 3 degrees of freedom. So, these are all the muscles the 
indirect flight muscles and then the steering muscles as you can see are off to a side and these are all involved in controlling how the wing moves okay so you can imagine how complex this system is okay so i'm nearly at the end of my talk uh, so i want to summarize just a little bit uh, about how insects miniature insects so what are the features of miniature insects that uh, that are uh, to be seen so uh, in general so you have antennae have fewer segments they have fewer sensilli uh, they are operating at a lower reynolds number so they they perceive the air as being much more viscous uh, than we do and so their odor perception may be diffusion limited this is a rather important point that you know i, I can't elaborate on right now eyes again fewer omatidia eyes the individual units of eyes cannot go smaller than a certain amount because they are limited by diffraction okay it is only so small you can make a lens before it begins to be useless uh and so the smaller diameter lenses so you know they can only have a fewer ones so that that means that they are not very well resolved eyes uh um and but they do have this other type of eyes called ocelli which are fine uh then you have wings are often reduced or lost they have typically fringed margins sort of like this uh, a lot of them show that clap and fling maneuver that you saw where the wings sort of clap together uh and they have enhanced wing beat frequency uh they have a few thorax and you saw there's all these linkages within the thorax uh, that allow them to coordinate things extremely fast and then of course the flight muscles which i spent a fair bit of time on what i did not talk about are this some of these flight related behaviors uh how they disperse you know even though they are very tiny they can sometimes go over large um distances i uh, an interesting story to tell you some years ago we were in panama uh doing some work on uh, migratory insects and we were catching these butterflies out on the lake uh, uh gatun in in just outside of the panama canal so you would chase these insects in boats capture them and you do experiment and we found that every butterfly that we captured had a nice red bindi you know it just made no sense what we looked at it closely turns out it was a little mite okay and the mite was exactly between the two eyes and we thought well how does it get there uh and i was talking the other day to somebody who's an expert on mites and he said that's very simple all they do is they hang out at flowers and when the butterfly puts its proboscis in they just climb up uh the proboscis and sit at the end of the proboscis which is exactly between the eyes and so they are hitching rides on on these migratory butterflies and that's how they spread far and wide so this is to summarize everything i've sort of told you um and just leave you with uh, a couple of videos so here's finally you know the our we were able to get this behavior the landing behavior in uh in the lab and this is uh this shows you how they land uh you can see now that we have two views uh so we we can get 3d information about the wings and uh, what i want you to notice i'll show this video again i want you to notice that right here the two the wings here are in perfectly in control and sort of large amplitude motion but right about here you will find that the amplitude goes down and i suggest to you that this is a fly going into neutral gear before it lands okay and you can see that in the plots right here as the amplitude goes down here's a movie of a fly that's chasing another fly okay this is the territorial behavior and watch how fascinating this is this is happening in three dimensions okay and it's happening in extraordinarily fast time scale then you'll see this all the time if you're paying attention okay so this thing entered this fellow's territory they're guarding territories both are males everything you're seeing is happening under less less than half a second by my estimate so it is sort of sumo wrestled to the ground okay 
Now, if the same fly, this fly is not necessarily always aggressive. Sometimes it's very romantic. And so if the fly actually happens to catch a female instead of a male, then this is what it does. See, it carries this female. You can see that its amplitude is very high. The female is not even trying to fly. It's, she's just happy to be transported. Uh, the fly will gently place her on a substrate. And immediately, when it doesn't have to carry her weight as well, the amplitude comes down, as you can see. There, you saw that? She's generating less forces. This, these are the sorts of things we really want to get at. And everything I've told you allows us to get insights into these kind of natural behaviors. And that's really the joy of what we are doing. I mean, to be able to go out, see a fly you know, while you're drinking a cup of tea, and just enjoy what it is doing, is, and, and know that inside of this fly is an extraordinarily complex machine, uh, uh, that's really the joy of this kind of work. So I want to stop there. There's all these people to thank, um, many more actually than these. Um, just broadly speaking, everyone in black are faculty members elsewhere that I collaborate with. So on the issue of musculoskeletal mechanics with uh, Dr. Gethi Hassan, Namrita Gundeya, uh, aerodynamics with uh, Dr. Shinyan Deng and Bo Cheng, uh, at, um, both in the US. Uh, on the migration studies, uh, which I didn't talk about today, is Professor Robert Dudley and Bob Strigley. Um, then the ones in blue are all students uh, who are in the lab at the moment. Um, the ones who uh, have, uh, are in lighter blue have, are people who have escaped uh, to bigger and better places. Uh, and the funding agencies, which have been extraordinarily kind. One of the nice things uh, about work like this is that you know, we're not curing cancer. We are not uh, even trying to cure cancer. We are trying to just understand nature. Uh, somebody somewhere is going to be looking at these results and they're going to be asking, what can we do with this? That's their job. Our job is to figure out how nature works. So I'm just going to stop there. There's a picture of the lab uh, in a particularly thoughtful mood. Um, thank you very much. How about the bithorax uh, mutant, which uh -huh. has, in Drosophila, bithorax yeah. mutant, which, which has got a halter changed to the wings? Yeah, unfortunately, they haven't been able to actually generate any muscles in that latter wing. Oh, really? So the mutant is pretty sick. <laughs> it's not oh. able to do much. Can I ask one more? Yeah. Uh, uh, you said about the indirect muscle uh, function. So how is it connected to the direct muscle? So that's a good question. So the indirect flight muscles are uh, actuating the, the big motions of the wing, right? The, the large excursions, angular excursions of the wings are because of the thoracic oscillations. The steering muscles are doing the subtle changes. So if I want to change the angle of attack, if I want to change the phase, or you know, if I want to move the wing back sooner rather than later, then the, that's where the steering muscles come into play. So the, uh, the importance of steering muscles is almost on a stroke by stroke basis. And the neurons that supply them actually operate uh, very, very fast. Um, some of them even every stroke. So, but they are specialized neurons. Now, the, it is not true that neurons can't operate at very high frequencies. They can go up to 500, 600 hertz even. But they can't do that and generate power at the same time. For a large muscle to contract takes time. But a small muscle can contract and can receive neural input at, at very rapid so size. These, but these are mechanosensory neurons. Well, they could be, for instance, yeah. It's very interesting yeah, to listen and very exciting to tell people. In the biology department, we keep fighting all the time. And the same thing when I teach biology, I keep telling, what is there in the name? I can replace with A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z. Still, 
yeah. it makes the same sense. But the students get uh, <laughs> driven away uh, by so many nomenclature. And I had a two problem when I was studying. I mean, it's an extended question. I, I'm not related to students. I mean, how in the evolutionary time scale, uh, such a complex machinery, if one visualize, you start behave, believing like as if somebody would have done that. Because uh, the insects, even they're evolving in a 400 million years time, this is point number one. And second, even in terms of material, one is excellent. The dynamics, the, the, the communication, uh, the chemistry of neural communication. But in terms of material, one is the muscle. But I'm more concerned about the thorax. Yeah. The one which is, it is the, if the muscle is doing the thorax, is constantly undergoing kind of a contractions and relaxation. So this has to be equally of a highly elastic in nature other than the muscular protein and other. And I was just curious to know how much work has been done on the insect other than knowing that they are the chitin, they are carbohydrate, on the material part of the thorax. So uh, to answer your first question, um, which is you know how does a complex structure like this evolve? Actually, this is a question that's very nicely um, addressed uh, by someone called Dan Eric Nielsen um, when you're specifically looking at uh, this the evolution of an eye. Okay, uh, an eye I would argue is about equally complex, right? And what he asked was, how do you go from a simple photoreceptor to a complex eye? How many iterations do you need? And so this was a computational study. Richard Dawkins has written a very nice piece on it. Um, and what he showed was that it takes very few iterations. If you give it just a slight selective advantage, then you don't need too much to go from a simple photoreceptor to a very complex eye. Then I would argue very much the same for the insect wing hinge. You know, it's, it is an extraordinary complex structure. But 400 million years is a long, long time. You know, and it's staggering how long this time is. Uh, you know, we humans have not even occupied an eye blink of that time. And yet, look at us. I mean, look at the, uh, the uh, effect we've had on our environment. So it's, you know, we're talking of something that has lived through all kinds of uh, environmental conditions, you know, through the asteroids hitting Earth and so on and so forth. I mean, these are strong selections. And of course, something complex can evolve uh, from that. Coming to your second question, which is about the materials of the, yes, a lot of work has been done on the materials. We know a fair bit about resilin, for instance. There's still a lot left to be known. Um, we know that, you know, that there are such structures. So the chitin itself um, is a complex of many different uh, proteins and carbohydrates. And uh, it, it has structural properties that often are geometrically uh, or the sort of so uh, you can have a thin or a thick cuticle, and you know the, the properties are different. Um, it's all fairly, you know, we haven't. I wouldn't say we have studied this question in detail in relation to the physics of it, but I think the biochemistry is very well worked out. Um, so we know a fair bit about the materials within insects, uh, as to their placement and positioning, and why certain materials occur in certain places. We know less about. Uh, this is probably not uh, centrally related to your talk, but I can't help asking this because of the last uh, videos that you showed. I mean, the behavior, one of uh, aggression chasing away another fly and the other one is uh, a different kind of behavior. So is there uh, something like an emotional life of uh, insects? And oh. Is there anything known about that? It's I mean, I, the term emotion brings up many anthropomorphic, you know, we, we can't seriously, I, I can't even for another human being um, talk about their perceptual sense. You know, it is uh, off to a point where it's almost uh, doesn't become, it's not a science anymore uh, to think in those terms. But in terms of, if we think in terms of complexity or 
um, if we say that you know there are certain basic qualities needed positive reinforcement negative reinforcement you know whatever is required for learning give flies any test and they are going to pass it they they have done extraordinary things with flies uh, where you tether them you you can get them to uh, you know do almost the same thing as what you do in a video arcade where you go and drive a car right you put in a coin it closes the loop and now you are able to control your uh, your uh, visual environment you can fixate on an object you can drive towards something flies can do that no problems and the you know virtual reality arenas in which flies are tethered you close the feedback loop and flies are able to control the visual environment and they do a fine job at it you can switch the games so for instance this is like you know you put prism uh, lenses on the eyes and now suddenly everything is backwards and over time humans will adapt to this flies do too you can almost throw any test at a fly and they are able to uh, do fine now of course they are not going to be able to solve equations <laughs> but you know we can't fly so give or take uh, but i think anything that has evolved to this time and through such uh, um, such um, uh, geological upheavals is you know I, I i would say smart and has you know many of the properties that you might say something like pleasure or pain or you know sadness or whatever uh, as to what it actually is, we can never tell. I can't tell for another human being, so I can't tell for science. But I would say that, yeah, I mean, I'm sure they have some emotional life <laughs> somewhere, by some definition of emotion. Uh, well, mentioning about, I mean, the latter part of your talk, you mentioned about the, your study on migratory butterflies you were observing. Uh, just curious to know like what are the uh, what is it like uh, that draws them uh, into migration uh, a lot is known about the migratory birds but here what is the uh, uh, need is it food is it the environment is it w uh, or just they want to want a different niche for breeding uh, well all of these and temperatures uh, temperatures are often the driving factors for what is a good location to breed and as environments become colder insects find it harder to survive so they go to warmer climates in other places like in Australia uh, there's a moth called the bogong moth which actually escapes heat and goes to cooler places uh, so my temperature drives migration temperature shifts day length shift drives migration uh, the requirement to find better food resources is connected to temperature so that also drives migration. There's many, many things uh, that drive these kind of large scale motion. And in fact, many birds migrate because insects migrate. <laughs> so they're chasing the food source. Yeah. But it's an amazing thing. There's a, a researcher called Charlie Anderson uh, who was working off in uh, Maldives who has recently made the claim, and it's a very, very reasonable claim. It's an extremely lovely paper, uh, which argues that dragonflies are flying from here. In fact, right from outside Bombay, you can see dragonflies going into the sea and uh, going as far as Africa. So it's extraordinary uh, what they are able to do. And what they are doing is hitching rides on the, uh, on the monsoon winds, or uh, the winds, the ITCs. The With reference to haltiers. Uh -huh. uh, connecting links between butterflies and haltiers. So butterflies, lepidopterans in general, are four winged. Uh, they have two pairs of wings. Uh, flies have one pair of wings and one pair of haltiers. Uh, connecting link, I don't know. Uh, you know, there are two separate clades in the current uh, point in time. And uh, they must have had a common ancestor at some point which had four wings, uh, so two pairs of wings. Uh, 
so butterflies are specialized. There is another uh, animal which has hot ears. This is called the strepsiptera, in which the front wings have become hot ears. And the front wings are doing similar things. I mean, the hot ears are doing similar things there as, as uh, in the case of flies. There are no further questions. No, there's one. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yes. yeah I, it seems to me that there are different kinds of uh, muscular movement or motions. I mean, there's something that's very little control, such as uh, say breathing or heartbeat. Right. And there's something that's very fine motor control, right. say speaking, right. vocalization right. And right. Right. in human speech. So, are there, is there an understanding of whether there are different classes and entirely different mechanisms controlling these and uh, the wing movements would come maybe somewhere in between, I'm just curious. I think that. that's an excellent question. Uh, in fact, we are just beginning to get understandings of, you know, what constitutes uh, fine control uh, from a motor neuronal viewpoint versus more of this autonomous control, which is uh, like our heart, uh, etc. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about, for instance, the developmental uh, history of these uh, motor neurons, but a lot is beginning to get described now. Uh, there's some really wonderful work coming out of, uh, well, University of Washington uh, was one of the places where a lot of this work was done. Um, in the labs of Jim Truman and Darren Williams and so on. And they have been describing these lineages uh, of neurons and trying to track down how these lineages uh, come about. And, um, you know, uh, we have uh, a group also working in NCBS on questions of these kinds. And maybe it's somewhere in those lineages that you have, you know, classes of neurons that are, you know, uh, involved in fine control or which innovate, let's say, just the steering muscles uh, and others. I don't know enough about this, but uh, I, I suspect that those are the kinds of studies that would give us the answers uh, to those kinds of questions. Okay. I'm sure there will be more questions, uh, but that can be handled over tea perhaps. So we now break for a short tea break. And we'll start the next part of the program at 11.35. So please come back to 11.35. And let's thank the speaker once more. <laughs> <laughs>